Jack Leiter is finally getting the call. On Thursday, Jack Leiter is going to make his Major League debut for the Rangers. Is he ready for it? And how long will he stay up with the Rangers? We'll talk about all that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers. Your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You are locked onto the World Series champion Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Paddock, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan covering this team for 11 seasons, including all six as the founder and host of this podcast. Thank y'all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform and on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Now, before we get into Jack Leiter earning his call-up and a stupid, silly, very annoying loss to the Detroit Tigers, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Now, in typical fashion, as soon as I finished recording my episode this morning, some big old news dropped literally about five minutes after I finished recording this morning's show in that the Rangers are calling up Jack Leiter on Thursday no longer will the starter for the series finale be TBD. It will be the young first-round pick Jack Leiter making his Major League debut against the Detroit Tigers in Detroit on Thursday. Welcome to the freaking show, Jack Leiter. What an accomplishment. What an exciting moment. What a fun moment for him, for his family, for Rangers fans who have had incredibly high hopes for this kid ever since the Rangers drafted him second overall in the 2021 draft. There was a lot of hype around him, a lot of pressure, and after a tumultuous first couple of years of pro ball, it's nice to see him finally get his shot in the big leagues. Now, is this the situation that I thought that he would be getting his big league debut in? No, and I texted this to, to Grant Schiller when I, I found out that Jack Leiter got the call. I said, if you would have told me two years ago, at the beginning of the season, that Jack Leiter would make his Major League debut in 2024 for the defending World Series champion Texas Rangers because the Rangers' best starting pitcher, Cody Bradford, had to take a stint on the I.L., I think you would have locked me in a mental institution at that time. And you would have been right to. But that's where we are two years later, which is still pretty darn fast. A, a good route to the big leagues. Leiter was projected as a very, very polished pitcher. Pretty much talked about as you know the most polished pitcher we've seen out of college in a long time. Maybe even since David Price. And, and Price took about five minutes to get to the big leagues. Some of these other pitchers that were extremely, extremely polished did not take very long to get to the big leagues. But that did not end up being the case for Jack Leiter. The Raiders were aggressive with him from the start beginning his his minor league career in double-A, which is not something you see very often. But, hey, this is a polished kid. This is a son of a former big leaguer, an, an all-star, a World Series champ, and Al Leiter. This is a kid who you know had the spotlight on him from the start of his career at Vandy and lived up to it and was exceptional. But minor league baseball is hard. Major League Baseball is incredibly hard, but double-A is really, really hard. Almost every single hitter that he saw in double-A was better than probably almost every single hitter that he saw in his entire collegiate career. It is a huge adjustment. It was a big ask, and it was a tough first year and, heck, a tough second year for Jack Leiter. The things that he kept messing up on were just missing over and over again with that fastball command, glove side, glove side, glove side. Every time it felt like he was missing with his fastball glove side, he was not able to throw it for quality strikes. And the breaking stuff that he was able to use effectively in college, able to get some more chases because college hitters are a little bit worse than, than pro hitters, especially ones that are in double A in the Texas League. 
he wasn't able to get those swings and misses as much out of the zone or, or as many called strikes with the breaking stuff with the curveball, with the slider. He ended up adding a cutter last year that he, he threw a lot more often and has a changeup that he throws occasionally, but not all that much. And it wasn't really effective until, you know, towards the end of last year, he came back to double A Frisco after his first year went so poorly had an ERA north of five his first year. And then it kept making the same mistakes over and over again in his second year being the same level, which, you know, not really that head turning for a guy who is what in his early twenties, I believe he is 23 years old at this point. Uh, yeah. 23 years old turns 24 uh, in three next week, <laughs> next week he turns 24. So still, still pretty young, still pretty quick path, the big leagues, but because he kept making the same mistakes over and over again, there was, uh, he went from being a, you know, consensus top 100 prospect in baseball to a, geez, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with this guy. I mean, he's still throwing hard. He was still getting swings and misses and the breaking stuff was still nasty, but it just it wasn't really the starters repertoire uh, repertoire that you envisioned with Jack Leiter going in. And, you know, he took some time on the developmental list last year. There was a lot of reworking of his mechanics and his delivery just to get that consistent missing the same way with fastballs every single time to be fixed. And it ended up working a little bit, made his AAA debut last year at the end of the season. I think, honestly, at that point, just getting out of Frisco, getting in a new venue is was incredibly helpful for his development and the fact that he didn't go, have to go back to triple a to start this or to double a to start this year that would have been real rough but he looked fantastic in the spring didn't get as many strikeouts as i was thinking that he might this spring but looked good got big league hitters out got that confidence up and and got his mechanics more in order more what the rangers were looking for and he really got to work in his three starts or three appearances in the minor leagues this year, he looked pretty much fantastic. I mean, this was the guy that the Rangers dreamed on when they drafted him second overall. This was the guy who they imagined being the first pretty solid, maybe mid-rotation homegrown starter the Rangers have had in a long time. His first outing of the season, five innings, no walks, nine strikeouts. Second outing, three and a third innings, couple of runs only one of them was earned three walk yeah a couple of runs only one of them earned three walks six strikeouts in those three and third innings not the best but then comes back the very next outing on the 12th of april goes six innings allows three runs all of them on solo home runs but then that was early in the game he buckles down finishes the game with 10 strikeouts zero walks that is what you're looking for those are the kind of changes that Jack Leiter made that made the Raiders say, okay, all right, I think he's ready. I think he's finally ready to face big league competition because if he did last year, even in the pen, with the amount of quality, uh, not quality strikes that he was throwing, he, he might still get hit kind of hard by this Detroit lineup. As we've seen, they can occasionally hit things, even the bottom of the lineup, which is just absolutely pretty much horrendous um but still he can blow that fastball by big league hitters he is using that cutter effectively he's using that slider effectively he is getting called strikes with the breaking stuff that gets him ahead in counts can get the chases can get the swings and misses with the four seamer with the cutter with the slider heck even with the curveball at times and the changeup. that is the effective starting pitcher that the rangers were hoping to get he has made massive strides there has been massive pressure on him, but I was never off the Jack Leiter hype train. I, I was worried, concerned, to very concerned towards the end of last year after that stint on the developmental list where he, it looked slightly better, but it was still a small sample size. I was like, okay, this, is, this isn't great for your former number two overall pick. Those are the guys that you can't miss on. The guys in the top five of the draft... Those are ones, picks that you cannot afford to miss on. The Jack Leiters, Kumar Rockers, the White Langfords, all of these top five picks that the Rangers have had the past three, four years, I guess just three years, It's it's been so far a pretty decent hit rate. We'll see how Kumar Rocker ends up turning out and 
the way they played that, it, it kind of used parlayed that high bonus pool into a Brock Porter as well that you could get in the fourth round with first round bonus money. Um, but still, you really can't afford to miss on those picks, especially when the Rangers starting rotation has gotten so expensive. You have Jacob DeGrom, you have Max Scherzer, you have Nate Eovaldi, and it's an older staff as well. You eventually need to develop some homegrown starting pitching Jack Leiter might just be that, but how long is he going to stick in this rota- rotation? Coming up, we're going to talk about that and a great start for John Gray going to waste in a silly game in Detroit. Right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Spring training is over and baseball season is officially underway. So don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond in your Prize Picks entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, first inning runs, take your pick of more or less, then add them to your Prize Picks entry today. Prize Picks is the best way to get in on the action and sports in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. Testing your skills on Prize Picks this baseball season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $100 with just a few taps. Prize Picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. Prize Picks also offers weekly promotions and special offers for the biggest moments in sports. So, Download the app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the PrizePix app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. PrizePix. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. This episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there before, either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low. You're not sure your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep. Lift your head up and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists, and take as much of my friend's money as possible. That's right, the smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone, anytime, with tons of new twists, including leaderboards, compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. Make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. Charge other players rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put your game face on, and download Monopoly Go. Now free in the App Store or Google Play. Now, the Rangers at times have had some struggles in their rotation, including early on John Gray having some rough starts. Not at all a rough start for him in Detroit, but the thought was maybe they could use Jack Leiter in this rotation. But I think at this point, it's pretty clearly going to be a one-and-done start for Jack Leiter, making his Major League debut in Detroit against the Tigers, then will probably go back down to AAA. Still has some things to work out. Is not you know a, a fully refined pitcher just yet and especially with John Gray having a great performance in this game of Detroit back-to-back great performances granted against not the best offenses I think it puts the Rangers in a spot where they feel much better about putting Jack Leiter back down in AAA round rock until they feel like he is fully ready to be a part of this rotation and to push one of these starters out of the rotation I think Andrew Heaney is probably going to be the first one out of this rotation. Dane Dunning's job is not guaranteed in this rotation. Bradford has done nothing to lose his job in the rotation, so whenever he gets back off the IL with that lower back strain, I have to think that he is going to be right back into his spot in the starting rotation. So Jack Leiter's not quite fully ready yet to stick through a fifth starter in this rotation every you know fifth day or sixth day or however often he would be pitching but I think his stuff is definitely good enough to get big league hitters out right now it is a little bit of a case of hey we're in a 17 game in 17 day stretch it's very early in the season definitely don't want to wear out these starting pitchers too early on you already have an injury to Cody Bradford you definitely don't want any more so giving this rotation that extra day of rest will be helpful for the long run but also he has earned the right with what he did in spring training, with what he did in his first three outings in Round Rock this year. I don't know if it's going to go perfectly for Jack Leiter's big league debut, but he's ready, and he has definitely earned that spot. 
just like John Gray has definitely earned his spot in the Rangers rotation. Another great outing for John Gray. Six innings, just one earned run. Seven strikeouts, three walks, including one to Javi Baez, who did not have a single walk at this point this year until this full count walk, where the first two pitches that he swung at were sliders that might have hit a left-handed batter in the ankles or the knees or the shins. They were so incredibly far out of the box and just honestly kind of typical Javi Baez swings, but hey, Props to Javi Baez for laying off a slider that for ball four that was actually pretty close. Even, I believe, ball two was a little closer to the zone than than I might have anticipated throwing that slider to Javi Baez and him actually taking, especially after those just horrendous first two hacks. But good on John Gray for getting a get-right game. The walks were not ideal. Was able to throw 97 pitches and, and go six innings in this one with just the one earned run. And one... One, one unearned run that was uh, thanks to a really just bizarre misplay by Evan Carter out there in right field. El Bombe getting the day off because, again, the Rangers are in this incredibly difficult stretch. Two very softly hit balls that ended up being the difference in the game were Matt Veiling's single at 63.6 miles an hour off the bat and Jill Urshela's single at 67.4 miles an hour off the bat. Because that's the way baseball goes sometimes. You look at Corey Seager's outs in this game. He had a fly out at 101 miles per hour that had a 580 expected batting average. Um, yeah, that was an out. Then he had a fly out at 103.4 miles an hour with a 730 expected batting average. Went 394 feet. And I believe had the wind not been, been blowing in, that would have been a home run about five rows deep. But again, because for some reason, this team is playing three straight day games in Detroit in the middle of the week, which I don't understand why. I have heard literally zero explanation. Um, that ended up being a flyout right on the warning track. And then a 97.8 mile an hour flyout with a 330 expected batting average that would have been a home run in three out of 30 parks. But it wasn't, even though it went 366 feet. And that was the ball game for Corey Seager. But all those hard hit balls, all of those flyouts, it is something that he hadn't really been doing as much early on in this season. It's why I was getting a little concerned with Corey Seager because granted he was hitting 300, had an on-base of 400, but he wasn't really stinging the baseball like we've been accustomed to seeing Corey Seager do. Now, slugging league-wide is down, the Rangers not having a whole lot of home runs at this point in the season is a little bit on them not putting together best at bats. White Langford not being as aggressive at early pitches as I would have liked. Still quality at bats for him. Um, and the Seager just not being quite right, as well as having two all star caliber hitters in the corner of your infield on the IL. And the guy who is backing one of those all star caliber hitters in Nathaniel Lowe up at first base has been Jared Walsh. And it has been. Honestly, brutal for Jared Walsh at this point. I mean, just an 0-4 day, and, and the reason the Rangers didn't let him hit, excuse me, an 0-4-3 uh, day with a pair of strikeouts, just swinging it missing at a lot of fastballs in the zone, which is a recipe for disaster. And the Rangers had Adoles Garcia, thankfully, on their bench to come in and pitch hit with a couple of runners on base in the ninth inning. Ended up flying out. That ended up being the ball game. But, I mean, even on some of those those lineouts in the ninth inning, I mean, Ezekiel Duran was swinging at the first pitch, but hit it pretty hard. 90 miles an hour and a 570 expected batting average. But, again, why not? Detroit playing incredible defense. That was kind of the story of this game. Some really good at-bats, including Wyatt Langford hitting a ball about 100 miles an hour, 99.9 miles an hour. Also had another very hard-hit ball that, you know, Javi Baez just made an absolutely incredible play on because that's why Javi Baez still has a job is because, you know, he can still make those insane defensive plays. But, you know, Wyatt Langford puts together a single. Josh Smith puts together an incredible at-bat. Honestly, an exceptional at-bat. Works a walk, takes four very, very close pitches, swings at one ball, and uh, or swings at one strike, then 
has a foul bunt that would have been a base hit had he been able to keep it fair, then gets the two strikes and takes some very, very close pitches, works a walk, and it has been just, that was a, a classic Josh Smith plate appearance from this year. They have been incredibly competitive at bats that he's put together. He has walked at a good rate. He is not striking out barely at all, which is really nice to see from a guy who the Rangers need a lot from. Honestly, they they need a lot of offense from him because Josh Young is on the IL till June 1st at least. The Rangers need stuff from him. They need quality at bats from Ezekiel Duran. Both of them provided that today. And uh, yeah, this Rangers offense has been not in the best way. But coming up and tell you why I'm not super concerned at this point, but starting to get mildly concerned right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball is in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs and slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and so easy to use. You can bet on Jack Leiter's first start. If the Rangers are going to win that one, what Jack Leiter is going to do. You can bet on Wyatt Langford to maybe hit his first home run. We'll, we'll see when that ends up happening. And you can also bet on him to win AL Rookie of the Year. All kinds of different odds. So go check it out. What are you waiting for? At FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Now, this Rangers lack of offense was incredibly frustrating in the loss to the Tigers, but I think what was more frustrating is is just the things that went right for Detroit that just kept on not going right for Detroit. The Rangers' offensive numbers have been way down from where they were last year. There haven't been a bazillion 10-run uh, explosions so far this season. I think eventually those will come, especially once the Rangers' actual good hitters start hitting like they are definitely capable of like mainly White Langford and Corey Seager start doing some real damage um, and the Rangers are putting together quality at bats putting together quality at bats with runners in scoring position but this is just one of those games where you throw it out the window you don't think about it because if you do for too much it's just going to make you pissed off there's no other way about it I mean a run scoring on a a ball getting by Evan Carter Run scoring on a wild pitch from your backup catcher. I mean, just little plays like that and a run scoring because the runner was sent in motion in the gap and a ball that went just over Wyatt Langford's head. Maybe Evan Carter makes that play in left field. Maybe he doesn't, but it's still just, it felt like every single thing that could go right for the Tigers, every little break went their way. Outside of Kerry Carpenter, who just is honestly an exceptional hitter. Like the guy can just freaking hit. I mean, he's hitting over 300 this year. He got had a multi extra base hit game, a double and a triple, which the Rangers were lucky to strand him at third base with a leadoff triple. That's not a great sign for this Detroit offense. But when you look at the bottom three liner hitters in this Detroit offense, they are frankly horrendous. I mean, you have three guys in your lineup with an OPS below 400. That is not what you're looking for. Uh, Javi Baez with a 374 OPS. Parker Meadows with a 320 OPS. Rogers, the catcher, with a 382 OPS. All of them hitting below 150. Two of them hitting 100 or worse. That, that's just, that's rough. It is a rough way to look about things. And, and the Rangers, well, you look at the bottom of their order. Leone isn't having the best offensive start to the season, but he's still putting together quality at bats. He's not striking out too much, and he's making some great plays defensively at the field. We saw why he was the Rangers' starting center fielder with a great catch in the Monday win to keep that game close, to keep another runner off the bases. We saw him just barely miss getting to that triple on a ball that was very well struck by Kerry Carpenter. Then he gets to another ball that was at the warning track when the ball was heading from the sun to the shade. A very, very difficult play to make, and Louis Tavares made it. Made a great play, and he has made some pretty darn good plays overall just consistently in center field. There have been a few misplays out there, but it's not anything too crazy. But you look at the bottom three in this lineup, and Tavares is probably the best hitter of those three in the bottom third of the range order right now. I mean, Kisner had finally his first hit of the season, a pretty good opposite field 
single, but is a guy who was supposed to be an offense first catcher. We haven't really seen much of that 0 for 12, I believe, to start his season, now hitting um, 0 71 as opposed to 0 0 0 0. Jared Walsh, after a very good first week of the season, is just getting it eaten up by uh, basically all kinds of pitches. And uh, unfortunately, Nathaniel Lowe is not going to be back anytime particularly soon. It's going to be another two to three weeks of rehab assignment for him in Frisco. Maybe he'll spend some time at Round Rock as well. Who knows? Um, but he's trying to get that oblique fully back into shape. And the Rangers are down two big bats. And the the depth of this lineup was what always made it special. It's what always made it good. It's what made it good last year. It's what will make it good this year. It's what made it good in the playoffs is that you don't have any weak hitters. Well, with what Walsh is doing right now, they have at least one weak hitter. And with Andrew Kisner as your backup catcher, well, if your backup catcher is is your offensive you know, weak link, that that's kind of what happens. <clears throat> but still, getting this little offensive production from him, a not great day at the plate for Evan Carter, who overall has been pretty solid for the Rangers. I mean, Simeon has been walking at a much better rate than he did last year and it's still not striking out a whole lot. Langford hasn't really gotten going. Seager hasn't really gotten going. Josh Young was incredible to start the season, and I feel like we keep forgetting how important missing that bat is. As great as Josh Smith has been, and at times we've seen some pretty good at-bats so far from Ezekiel Duran, and I think we'll continue to see some pretty good at-bats from Zeke Duran, maybe even more at first base with Walsh struggling this mightily um, and Nathaniel Lowe not quite yet set to return off the I.L., I think we'll see a lot more of Zeke Duran, even against right-handed starting pitchers. The depth of this lineup, you can only get so much depth before you have to say, okay, well, sometimes this just is what it is. Sometimes you have games like this. I mean, the Tigers were 0 for 8 with runners in scoring position on Monday's game. They were 1 for 8 in this one, and somehow they still ended up getting four runs because that's Ron Washington Angels manager, former Ranger great, said, sometimes that's the way baseball go. And right now, baseball is not going super great for this Ranger squad. But again, you got to look at the positives. John Gray having a bounce back outing. He's going to be incredibly important to this Rangers staff as they wait on all the reinforcements to get healthy, especially with Bradford on the IL, with uh, Jack Leiter being an unknown coming up and making one, two. We'll, we'll see if he gets multiple starts in the bigs. I'm not entirely sure that he will before getting set back down. The Rangers will have to make a 40-man roster move. I'm not exactly sure what that roster move is going to be. Maybe it's going to be Brock Burke heading from the 15-day IL to the 60-day IL with that broken hand. Maybe the Rangers just cut bait with Austin Pruitt. It, it just, just cold turkey. I don't know if that's going to be the move. We'll, we'll see what they end up doing. Um, but right now... Getting some help from their starting rotation, getting this outing from John Gray is huge because as they wait for Max Scherzer, talked about his timeline to come back in yesterday's show, or I guess this morning's show, um, he is going to be incredibly important. But of the guys in this rotation right now that are healthy, I, I, th I think John Gray has the highest upside. Maybe I'm sleeping on Michael Lorenzen, um, but Gray, we, we've seen him have, you know, two one to two to maybe even three month stretches where he looks really, really good. He's been inconsistent. The walks are still a problem with him so far this season, but Hey, he wasn't squared up very much in this one. Got a lot of swings and misses in this game. 16 swings and misses in this game to be specific and was able to work around trouble for the most part. I mean, just one earned run with, with him in this game is what you're looking for, for a guy who's going to be, the middle of your rotation, probably once the Rangers get to the playoffs, if everyone's healthy and performing like you'd expect, Gray probably ends up in the bullpen, which we saw him thrive in that role last year. This bullpen could still use some improved depth. A, a pretty good day for Jose Ureña, just ruined by by random nonsense, honestly. An inning in two-third where he struck out three, only allowed one walk, and that ended up being an earned run for him. His ERA is now north of four. Jacob Latz allowed his first earned run of the season. Again, just on a bloop, silly, goofy hit that just trickled through and a wild pitch. And sometimes that's all it takes. And then you go up against the Tigers' bullpen, which has been incredible this season, was exceptional last year in Alex Lang and Andrew Chafin in Foley as well. 
who got his fifth save of the season already and still has not allowed an earned run at this point. It is a frustrating pattern for the Rangers to not get any real offense going, to not take advantage of the chances that they had. Had a couple of hits with runners in scoring position, two for six, solid. Honestly, solid. But just these little un, unlikely, un, off-brand, you would say, defensive miscues and just goofy little things falling through. Every team's going to have you know probably about 10 of these losses a year. It's just how they go. And you can sit there and scream about everybody sucks, everything sucks, everything's terrible, or you can just breeze past it, move on, take a deep breath, and say, hey, let's look at Thursday. Jack Leiter's going to be a big leaguer. That is something that is awesome. That is something that will be fun. It will be exciting. We'll see if it will be actually good, because... You never know what a kid's going to look like in his first big league start, but I am so freaking proud of Jack Leiter. All the work that he's put in, all of the hours and the effort and the film sessions and the bullpen sessions and the you know iPad watching, all of the game tracking, pitch charting, everything that he has done, he has worked his tail off. He is such a smart, hardworking kid and so freaking talented. The ceiling, the ability to reach the ceiling is, is still there for Jack Leiter, but I think of this first start especially, and I've been playing it more of a cautiously optimistic approach with Jack Leiter, th- there's still plenty of room for development for this kid. He is in his early 20s, and you know the sky is the limit for him. And even if he ends up as a mid-rotation or back-end rotation starter, the Rangers have been so desperate for literally even one of those guys to be homegrown and to get it from the guy with all the expectations in the world, all of the weight of the hopes and dreams and eyeballs I have, like none I've ever seen on a Rangers pitching prospect in the 11 years that I've been covering the sport. It is a great thing that he is getting his big league debut. I am proud of this kid, and I am so incredibly excited to watch what he's going to do on a big league mound in a Texas Rangers uniform for the first time on Thursday. That's going to do it for today's show. Thank y'all so much for listening and subscribing. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy World Series champion Texas Rangers baseball.